Hey everyone, John here for Hatch Facts, and today I'd like to go over the difference between an ESA font and our new ESA elements. Now the elements have become very popular, but to use them properly, they have to be treated a little differently than an ESA font. Now with our ESA fonts, all of the uh, optional ESA fonts that we've created, I've always put the measurement after the name. So here we have one that is an eight millimeter font, this one's 18, this one is 25. And the idea is that if I choose a font and it says Boston 15, then the default size for that font should be changed to 15 millimeters. So when I type in my text, I know that it's going to always run best. It's going to not have any issues with it if it is run at 15 millimeters. If you start to go too small, if you try to do this as an eight millimeter font, I guarantee that some of these areas that are right here where they branch off into smaller areas, you're definitely gonna have problems, hard stitches, and potential thread breaks. So I do put that little safeguard in there, and the reason why I do that is I, I have enough experience when I create these fonts that I know the minimums that they should run at. Uh, the minimums on a font are far more important than the, the maximums when we're talking about ESA fonts because they are truly object-based. Now I'm gonna grab this and I'm gonna just delete that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, work with my elements. Now keep in mind that the elements, we also name them with a Z and a Z after or at the beginning of each of the elements. And the reason why is that way they run at the very bottom of your list. Uh, the elements take a long time to generate, so to speak, because there is so many different objects in them. Now I'm just going to call it the crown element here. And uh, if I want to use an element, the first thing that I suggest that you do is go to your grid. And your grid is turned on at this point. You can tell because it's kind of that light orange color. If I right click on my grid, my grid properties come up. And now I can change this grid to one millimeter boxes. So I'm changing it from the default, which is 10. And I'm turning it into one and I'm gonna click OK. Now you'll see that I have a whole bunch of tiny little squares come up. And that's a good thing because that gives me a visual of what a millimeter actually looks like on the screen. Now, when I'm bringing in an element, I suggest that the minimum size you bring it in at is probably 50 millimeters, anywhere from 50 to 100. And I know that sounds large. We can resize them later, but you have to remember that a letter is made up maybe of a, you know, six to a dozen uh, different objects at the most. When you're dealing with elements, some of the elements that I've created have sometimes 50 different objects, and that's why it's taking so long for them to generate. Now, the other thing you want to remember is when you call up the element, ESA element, you don't want to use your keyboard lettering, your keyboard uh, you know, letters on your actual keyboard to find the object you're looking for. You want to click on insert character. And when you click on that, you'll see all the different elements appear. Now here's where if I choose A, which is assigned to this specific crown, and I bring it in at 50 millimeters, it's going to come in at this size right here. And I'm just gonna very quickly change that to a gold crown because that seems a little more logical to me. But what you wanna see is that you have a millimeter here and that most of the objects are staying close to a millimeter and at the very, very smallest, a half a millimeter would be the minimum that I want to do. If you've watched any of my lessons on theory, uh, you'll know that I have minimums and maximums for all three stitch types. And with a running stitch, and really a satin stitch is a series of running stitches that are going back and forth, I would never want to do a satin stitch or a running stitch less than 0.5 millimeters. You're asking for a thread break because the mass of the, the width or the mass of a thread in itself is you know 0.3 to 5 to 0.4 millimeters. It's like the machine is sewing in the same place over and over again. So at 50 millimeters, I can look at this design visually, use the grid behind it sort of as a a backdrop to assess my stitch lengths, and I can see at 50 millimeters this would work just fine. If I change this to 20 millimeters now, and I hit the enter button, there I can see that this is definitely not going to work. You will not be able to run this design at 20 millimeters, because if I zoom in and look at some of these tiny little objects here, oops, I accidentally made it bigger, let's just undo, and undo one more time, 
and I'm going to hit the B key and go to zoom box to zoom in, you're going to see that these are way too small. This is going to create havoc on your machine, thread breaks, bird net, bird's nest, and all that good stuff. So let's just go back out of here, go to a one-to-one -one scale, and then I'm going to bring this back to that 50 millimeters that I was uh, wanting to be. So we'll change it from 20, bring it back to 50, and let's bring that in at full screen and we can see that this is actually going to run well on the machine. Now the really cool thing about elements is that you can make them much, much larger. I'm going to uh, actually go to US from metric here. I'm gonna grab this object, see that right now it's about uh, two inches in height. Let's actually change that to eight inches in height. So this is gonna be a full jacket back, eight by 10. Let's hit the enter button and we now have a gigantic design. Now any other uh, file that you would ever try to do that to, you would have disaster on the machines. But let's put it this way, you cannot just stitch this out the way it is. We have to go into our properties, and if I look at my fill stitch, I can see that my satin is turned on. If I were to auto split, you're gonna see that all of this splicing takes into effect, and it did mess up this area here. This design cannot run at a satin stitch, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change it to a fill stitch. When I change it to a fill stitch, I can see now that all the objects are still nice and clean, and this is where I can start to have some fun. I can play with my pattern fills, change this to a beautiful rope effect, and that would lend itself perfectly to this type of design. Now this design right now is 60,000 stitches set at pure cotton, so I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to change this to a different uh, auto fabric and let's just actually bring it down to tie silk so it actually takes out a lot of the stitches and now it's gonna go from 60 down to 40,000 stitches and then I can look at my underlay and I can see that my underlay is set it to Tommy. Let's change that to an edge run and then change it to have a tatami stitch underneath. So now I have an edge run with a tatami, and if I turn off my true view and I look at my stitches, let's escape here, I can see that I actually have a nice tatami area here. So I have a tatami stitch with an edge run. This is gonna be nice and clean, has 48,000 stitches. And to be honest, for a design that size, that's really not, not bad. I mean, we have a design that is actually 10 inches, over 10 inches in width, but it actually only has 48,000 stitches in it. So this is how I would successfully use a ESA um, you know, font. Uh, is by going in there and using the backdrop to make sure that it's going to run properly. Now I'm gonna give you one more example why bringing in the uh, background and the grid is so important when, when you're using ESA elements. I'm gonna bring in a different element this time and let's just scroll down and I will find an element that is called uh, ESA elements and floral and laurel elements, and this is it here. Now I'm gonna also come in and again, bring that to 50 millimeters, not 10 millimeters, and I'm going to go to insert character, and let's just bring in this one right here, it's number five, and it's a nice laurel with a little bit of lettering in there, and there it is, it's perfect. Now, if I look at this, this is actually going to sew out pretty well at uh, the actual 50 millimeter size. And I'm just going to click off the screen. Actually, let's back up there. I want to click off the screen, bring that up to full size. And you can see that all the widths of the, the letters are falling just underneath a millimeter, which means that this design is going to still run well uh, given the size that's there. But if I were to take this design and I'm going to actually bring it down to the default, which is 10 millimeters, you're gonna see that in this situation, I am now going to have disastrous results. There's no way that this design is going to run and be legible. The objects are just too small for it to render properly. Now, the other reason why I tell people please use at least 50 to 100 millimeters, some of our elements get very, very detailed, and I've actually been able to crash the software uh, because I've gone too small with such, uh, you know, I guess, uh, such detailed 
objects that are going into creating all of these elements. So they are wonderful if you understand the theory of how to set your grid properly, you understand some basic theory of stitch length, and if you have that in place, then there really is no limitations to playing with these elements. And keep in mind, they truly are still object-based. You can break them apart and you can customize them however you want.